Hello again. Welcome to Pluralsight Spotlight. I'm your host today, Adam Gunn. If you're new to this series, let me set the table for what you're going to learn today. Our Spotlight series is a chance to meet some of the incredible people that differentiate the Pluralsight platform. Our brand is built on the back of our incredible course authors who bring the best of themselves to every course they publish. And it's my privilege to have in the Pluralsight Spotlight today, Henry Bean. Henry is an independent DevOps and Azure architect in the Netherlands. He loves sharing with the community and to do so speaks internationally, writes a blog, and does live training. Henry has been awarded the Microsoft MVP award four times and has recently published a book, which we're gonna dive into in a bit. Henry, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So you're from the Netherlands. What, what brought you over here this week? Um, I'm visiting headquarters um, together with nine other authors. We are part of what, what is called the Author Advisory Board. So we talk with leadership within Pluralsight two times a year to discuss things that are important to authors and things that are important to Pluralsight and how we work together. And what would the benefit be to the learners on Pluralsight of this, uh, of this week's engagement? I think one of the things that is very important for us as authors is what do we teach um, and, and, and to whom? And that's the thing, the context that Pluralsight uh, provides to us. Um, last offer summit, I learned, for example, that you spend a lot of time on positioning your products, deciding on who to target, which uh, niches in the market, which type of learners. And we can take that on board um, when we prepare our courses. So each course is targeted towards a specific type of learner. That's awesome. We like to start these interviews, you know, diving into a little bit of your personal journey in tech oh, no. and your backstory. Um, how'd you get here? Like give the audience a, a little taste of, uh, you know, what brought you to this moment? I think it comes down to two blocks of 10 years. So the first 10 years I, I studied, um, that's normally five years in the Netherlands, but I managed to take 10. Um, and the other 10 is, uh, is like really working in the field. I started at an ISV. I worked there for five years, which is quite a lot longer than a lot of people in the industry, especially for their first job, uh, which I really value looking back um, because it gave me the time not just to do things and learn things, but also to learn from my earlier decisions and mistakes and not you know, having moved somewhere else before learning from those mistakes. So that's one of the things that I really value. And after that, I went freelance, um, given the circumstances of where I, where I live. I've worked at a number of large companies and at some point somebody reached out to me, do you want to write a book? And I said, yes. And that leads from one thing to another, for example, plural side asking if I wanted to author for them. I want to dive into that freelancing phase of your, of your career. Cause my assumption is in freelancing, you get a, maybe a broader perspective than if you were, you know, working for, you know, a single, within a single industry or for a, a single, singular company? Yes. Um, I, let me start by saying that f staying at one company for a longer period of time really was valuable for me to learn a lot. Um, but freelancing indeed allows you to see a lot of different companies, different uh, perspectives. I've worked at a large bank, uh, which has, you know, it's, it's compliance, it's regulations, and they're willing to spend a lot of time on mitigating risks instead of only focusing on outcomes that they want to achieve. Uh, I've worked at a blood bank, which was really, really risk mitigating. Um, very um, important things they do there that have impact on people's lives. And now I'm working at a builder, a construction company that is also doing IT projects. So that's a completely different look on IT. They are really focused on what do we want to achieve and are maybe even less aware of the risks that IT brings to their company. So they're really different angles and one of the things that i see is now that i've been f visiting like i think my sixth company or something i look back at the things that i did at my second and my third and i'm like why why did i do that so yes there is definitely learning in uh, in switching different perspectives and do you do you find in any particular ways you bring that perspective into the courses and and books that you bring i do find that when that i have the tendency when i explain something technical I make these little side notes. You want to use this when, or you, you don't want to do this when. And I think that's the different experience that you've had at some companies that you just don't say, this is a best practice, period, but say, hey, if you are in this context, you want to do A. But if you're in another context, you want to do B. 
So you have seen the different sides of the choice and not just the one and adopt it like it's the one best thing ever to do. Very cool. I wanted to talk to you a little about DevOps. Um, it's I can relate as as a vice president of brand. Like it almost scares. It's the simplest question. Like how do you define brand? But I, it terrifies me because like, do you have ten hours? Like it it depends on your context, the size of your business, um, you know, your outcomes you're trying to achieve. And it feels like DevOps has evolved into you know, kind of having a similar burden. Like, would you agree with that? Like, where do you start and what are you, what are the principles of DevOps that, you know, are most critical? Well, well I would agree. I, I don't think I ever bring up DevOps as something that I do anymore because it is so overloaded and has different perspectives. But for me, it means that in a team, uh, we focus on the value that we want to deliver and we build our solutions, but for example, also our team or team structures or organizational structure around those goals or the components that we need to deliver those goals. Um, and then we bring in all the technical things like infrastructure as code, uh, continuous deployment, uh, maybe getting people that come from an IT pro background, sitting in the same team as somebody that is a developer, or maybe have them in separate teams, but very closely working together. Um, but all that follows, for me at least, from that starting point, we want to focus on delivering value to our users. That's what DevOps is all about, streamlining that. I love that. I've heard a lot of people just talk about it's getting code to market and and not necessarily focusing on, I guess that is an outcome, but not, I, I don't think the outcomes that you're necessarily talking about. No, no, because actually research shows that of the features that you ship towards production, uh, one third brings value. So that's what we're looking for, right? That's great. Then there is another third that doesn't really do much for the value perception by your customer. So basically that's just maintenance load that you're going to be carrying for the rest of your product's lifetime without getting anything out of it. So you want to maybe pilot those features and then discard them. But the third category is the worst, which is apparently also about a third. That are features that are detracting value from your product. So there are things that you and your brilliance dreamt up as a product manager. You verify that with people around you. And then you go to market and people say like, meh, that's actually not a good thing in my situation or in my eyes. So shipping code is not the goal, shipping value is. So one of the things that I think is important of DevOps is really making sure, are we going to build something that delivers value? So fast feedback, maybe first go to 10 customers with a wireframe and then a initial design, and then maybe start building something. So that's focusing on value instead of focusing on code for me. I want to shift. Um, I want to shift to your book. Um, I think a lot of people watching this are like, "Why are they talking about a book on a plural site series?" But I see this as a platform for you know things that kind of are unique to you know plural site authors. Um, and I, I found it fascinating that you've you know recently published a book. So tell the audience about the book and how you balance authoring courses for Pluralsight with traditional publishing. Um, so the book is about infrastructure as as code, uh, but focused on the Azure native tools. So no, for example, not Terraform, what a lot of people then directly ask about. And it is a bit in a broader context. So not just creating resources in Azure, but also policy. Um, how do I scale this across multiple teams by reusing things? Uh, we discuss both ARM templates and BICEP. We talk about testing them. So a wider circle around the topic, but focused on Azure Native. That's what the book is about. Go buy it all. So the book is awesome. How do books complement learning on the Pluralsight platform? Yes. Um, I think it really depends on what kind of learner you are. I, for example, am somebody who really loves a book. I, I almost snuggle up on the couch and, and start learning about technology by reading a book from cover to halfway, three quarters. We all do it. Research shows we all throw a book away at some point. That's how I learn. I get everything in my brain about the product and then I get my hands on it. And then I'm very quickly to progress using the product. Um, but that's not how everybody works. A lot of people find it hard to read and take in a lot of theory, front loading is what we call it, um, and then translate it into concrete things to do much later in time. So a lot of people want something 
um, in a much more practical and applied way brought to them. And I think video can do that. Right from 10 minutes into a video, you can start showing things and telling, and start maybe um, with a very small concrete example, explain that and expand upon that and then alternating between theory and, and demo. And a book is just, you know, one long theory. Yeah. Henry, my team wanted me to ask, the, the covers of these books are always so unique and a little bit obtuse. Um, tell us about the cover. Sure. Um, so let me spoil something. It has nothing to do with the contents of the book. But it is, it's a tradition within Manning uh, that they pull pictures from some kind of 19th century collection and they put them on the cover of the book. Uh, so we were presented with three choices and we just took the one that we found the most appealing to the eye for reasons unknown to everyone. I wanted to ask, we recently did a state of upskilling report. Um, and in that report, we asked how do teams um, make time for new skills and what gets in the way? And I don't know, it's probably because of how I learn. One of the biggest barriers to learning is finding time. Um, I'm curious for you if, you know, what your perspective is on time being a, a barrier to learning for individuals and for technology teams. One thing that just strike, strikes me is that you first talked about making time and later on you talked about finding time. I think you're never going to find time. It's never that you're going to be at your desk at free and like, wow, I really don't know what to do next. Maybe I can learn something new. You really have to consciously make time for learning. Um, and that comes in a number of ways. Um, one of the things that I find give me a lot of insight, so that's maybe more reflecting on learnings, is taking a walk. It's taking time away from the keyboard, from the team, from the buzzing and the beeping and the notifications, but to really spend time thinking. Just say to people, I'm, I'm away, I'm thinking. It's not common anymore, but I, I really value it. Uh, another thing is consciously setting time apart. This is very anecdotal, but in the team I'm currently working with, somebody came up to a manager and they asked if they could spend one hour a week on actually learning on Pluralsight. And they wanted to do Friday afternoon because that doesn't, doesn't, have, doesn't, have, doesn't have the most impact on their work week. So the manager said, no. He said, just do it on Monday, first thing. Just tell the team you're not going to be there and do, do two hours or three, whatever. But don't feel this urge to make it minimal and on the least impact time. So that's a very good thing. I think that goes to speak that if people in the leaves of the organization don't find time to learn, maybe that's something that in other places of the organization we can fix by telling people to just make the time. So that's how I look at it. Um, conscien consciously set time apart. And maybe as a final tip, if you face a new type of problem or you have to work with a new type of technology, don't spend 10 hours on from zero to trying to get it to work but spend eight hours on learning the technology in a methodical way. So take some plural side, take a book, um, then do a little pet project and then do your actual work in two hours. And then you don't only have achieved the same thing, but also you have worked on a body of knowledge that you can also learn use in another context. Because if you only solve it, or only focus with, at solving a very specific problem, it's very unlikely you get very generalizable knowledge out of it. So that's things that have worked for me and maybe will work for others yeah. as well. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great reminder that, you know, both words matter and, you know, I'd like to find money in the couch cushions. Um, <laughs> is that a thing here? But, uh, you know, your best chance to mon find money is to make money. Like you have to go and make a, a plan and, and, um, commit to it, put in the effort and the work. So um, I really appreciate it. That's a great perspective um, on that. Well, it's been great to get to know you, Henry. And the the team's asked me to ask a few kind of fun and unexpected questions here at the end of this interview to keep you on your toes. Are you game to play? I'm braced for impact. Okay. Some, some Dutch candor might uh, come into play here. So I don't know why I always ask this one first, but it's such a fascinating question to me. If you could switch legs with any animal, which would it be? <laughs> uh, let's go for cheetah. Nice. Cheetah. Okay. Do you have a secret talent? I'm really good at finding uh, new wordings for existing melodies. Um, 
Yeah, but they should always remain secret. <laughs> um, favorite food? Spare ribs. Favorite pizza topping? I'm not a pizza man. Our first one. I thought all developers love pizza. I don't like a, a melt a molten malt cheese. Okay. So every everywhere you go, people take a delicious thing and then they start putting cheese on it. And I'm like, how am I gonna tell how am I gonna tell them that I don't like that? <laughs> so I just politely put it to the side and then eat around it. So no pizza for me. Okay. I assume you're not reading your own book. Is there something that you're reading right now? Uh yes, I'm actually uh I was sitting on an uh, e-reader waiting here. I'm just reading a um, a novel. So I do read tech, um, but again, this is about finding peace and, and, and rest. I've, I've worked for a couple of hours and then I spent half an hour reading something completely different. I like it. And uh, is there something you're particularly learning or a uh, skill you're developing right now? Not really, because I'm, I really have to take my own advice. Um, this is not going to be aired for a few days, so I can say it here. Um, it's one of the things that I found the last few years that I've been working really hard and not spending enough time learning. So one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to take three months away from uh, my work to really focus on finding peace and quiet, a complete building my house, which is a thing, and uh, also have some time for getting a number of certifications and really spend time doing some deep learning myself again. I love that. Team cat or team dog? Dog, dog. <laughs> It's great. It's it's a it's hotly contested. Absolutely, my wife is completely the other way around. So we're not getting a cat because I don't want to, and we're not getting a dog because she doesn't want us to get one. So that's the standstill. <laughs> a stalemate. Absolutely, a stalemate. That's awesome. Well, Henry, it's been a privilege having you on the PS Spotlight stage today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being in town so we could have this interview face to face. It's been great to get to know you. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We'll have links to Henry's book and any other uh, content that we referenced in the show notes. We hope you'll give us a follow. We hope you'll give us feedback and we hope you'll join us on our next episode of Portal Site Spotlight. Thanks everyone.